Hi. Hi, Tom. I'm so happy to be here. I'm so happy to have you. How are you? I'm good. That's a real how are you because I like... I can sense it. Yeah. I can sense the sincerity. Because because it's it's wild to be you right now because not only is this book out, like you can't really get a copy of it. It's, it's sold out so quickly. I mean, you can get a copy of it, but it's selling out everywhere. And you are doing a lot of talking to people like me about it. How are you feeling now that it's it's out there? Mm, I'm so thrilled with the reaction. I never expected this to happen. Uh, it's been kind of blowing my mind. I have been, I mean, it's been, what is it, two days, I guess, since it's released. And I, I haven't slept well the past two days because I've just been so like giddy and excited and, and um, just so happy that people are reacting to it the way that they're reacting to it and getting from it what they're getting from it. It, it, it was my hope that it would connect with, with anybody who read it this way. I certainly, though, didn't expect it to connect with this many people this way. It's I, really like it, it really touches me. I want to I want to talk about your mom a little bit, if that's all right. Yeah. You uh, you call her the the heartbeat of my life. Yep. Can you tell me more about that? I felt that from as for as far back as I can remember, my earliest memories, you know, even those little glimpses or flashes of memories from three, four, five years old. Um, I just remember my whole life being sort of oriented to her and orchestrated around her and what she wanted and what she needed and what would make her happy in any moment. And it's different for me now, uh, of course. And I talk about all of that kind of, that's the entire arc of the book. But I will say, I think she'll always remain in some ways, the heartbeat of my life. I think there's always something um, about that relationship that will stick with me and inform who I am and who I continue to be. Um, Jeanette, what was she like? Layered and complicated. She what, could be very charismatic. She could be very captivating. Um, her energy could be infectious to a room for better or worse, whatever that energy was. So, you know, there were definitely a lot of times where it was for worse and her um, sort of rage or domineering energy uh, impacted, certainly impacted me in Difficult ways. Um, I, I definitely felt a lot of anxiety uh, and fear from from her when she would go to those really dark places. But you know, the flip side of the coin is that she was capable of being really captivating. She pitched you on acting when you were six, right? Yeah. When I was, she had always wanted to be an actress herself. She had wanted to be an actress. She tried and tried with her parents, and they were like, "We're not signing you up for acting, Debbie." And so I think that she saw an opportunity in me and, and uh, kind of saw a way of maybe fulfilling, definitely fulfilling her dreams. Do you remember how you felt when you were six and your mom pitches you on acting? God, I felt like I knew immediately in the moment that it was going to happen, that it had to happen. And that's such an interesting question because... Now I'm able to kind of, when I look back, recognize how much discordance there was between what I wanted and what my, what responses were coming out of my mouth. So anything that came out of my mouth was always to please mom, but oftentimes, absolutely more often than not, I felt that whatever she wanted was really against what I wanted or what I thought was right or what I thought was, um, you know, even the right way to deliver a line, for example, oftentimes I, I disagreed with her. But um, but I didn't know how to really locate that part of my voice. And so instead, I was just doing what I thought she she wanted of me and really suppressing that uh, internal voice myself. Those are the most powerful parts of the book for me is, is when you would write these like your mom would request something of you or ask you to do something. And there, you write paragraphs of all the tumult and all the anger and all the desperation that you feel as she asks you to do that. And then after those two paragraphs, you just write essentially like, yeah, no problem, mom. Like after all of that, it all ends with, yeah, okay, I'll do it. Sure. No problem. Yes. Yeah, absolutely. There's, there's been a lot to unpack uh, since her passing and a lot to piece together. And, and I, I found those um, portions of writing really um, fulfilling. I'd like to talk to you about what child acting does to a child. So one of the stories that I found captivating in the book was you are like, you're a, you're a baby, like you're a child mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. you audition for this movie called because of Win Dixie. 
and then you don't get it. You get passed on. Yeah. And I mean, I think getting passed on and, and turned down from an audition as an adult really sucks. Sure. But you sure. can kind of tell. Can you tell? Talk about that a little bit, like because you can kind of tell what it would do to a child. Yeah. Well, so my mom was always really concerned with my physical appearance. Um, I think that would have existed whether or not she had put me in acting, but it only amplified once she put me in acting. And there were many sort of weekly rituals that we had. Um, she would do like a Rite Aid run where she'd pick up eyelash tint and clear um, eyebrow gel to like run through my eyebrows and uh, hair highlights. And she would do all these things to me that, and Crest White Strips was a big one, but it was the knockoff brand because she couldn't afford like the, store rot, the, the, the Crest brand, she could only afford the store um, So I would have these like white strips on my teeth, the highlights on my hair, just like very, very much an uncomfortable thing for a, a six-year-old to be sitting in, you know? Six no, years no, old, by the way. I want to say that again, old. six years old. Yeah, 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 six years old. Very uncomfortable. Um, so then, you know, a couple years in, I get this audition, a couple years into acting, I get this audition for Because of Winn-Dixie, and my mom's like, why, or, or I don't get an audition for Because of Winn-Dixie. My mom's not sure why I'm not getting the audition. She calls my agent and is like, what's going on? Like, I'm everybody's going out on this. Why can't my daughter get an audition? Like screaming at my agent, who I'm sure was horrified. Um, poor Meredith Fine, if <laughs> Meredith happens to be listening to this. Um, but then the my agent had said um, that they, the, the feedback was that I didn't look like an ethereal beauty and that was what they had wanted for that role and that I looked too homely. So that was why I, I wasn't sort of given the audition. And you write, it was the first time I wished I was prettier. Yeah, I, I, didn't, I wasn't concerned with appearance. I was, you know, so little and I was, I was grew up very tomboyish. I had three older brothers. I appreciated the ease to the way that they were able to just kind of exist and dress. And it seemed very, it was very alluring to me. And I always kind of wanted that, but just accepted what my mom wanted of me and her poking and prodding and white strips and hair highlights. But that was really the first moment where I realized, oh, I don't think I'm, I think mom, I think all this is because mom doesn't think I'm attractive enough. That shows up as you start to go through puberty. You, you know, your mom, who at that point was a cancer survivor, um, you know, so you were always concerned that the cancer would reappear. And you, as a, as a little girl, are giving yourself, you know, tests and you feel a lump on your breast, but you learn that it's just a breast developing. You learn that your body's changing and that freaks you out because you, well, your mom doesn't want you to grow up. You're worried you're going to start losing roles. And in a really harrowing moment of the book, you, you say to your mom, you know, how can I stop this from happening? How can I stop getting older? How can I stop developing? And she says, well, there is a way. And she introduces you to something she calls calorie restricting, which, you know, leads to, I mean, doctors and, and people within your field talking to you about anorexia. And it's, it's clear that that's, that's anorexia. The, the reason I bring that up is because, and I'm not sure how to ask this, Jeanette, but like your mom was also calorie restricting. You yes. talk about that, like, right, because like you guys would share undressed salads and stuff like that, right? Yep. Is there something about both of you having this disordered eating together that in a perverse way is like a closeness, like a bond between you? What? Oh, my God. What a nuanced, brilliant question that I think is so important to talk about, because it's I think I think it's everywhere with eating disorders where the more entrenched you are in that disease the more you, the instinct is to latch onto other people who are that entrenched in the disease. And it's almost like, I mean, just, it just gloms together and, and perpetuates the cycle. And you, you literally, no pun intended, you feed each other, you feed off of each other. And the eating disorders are just, um, they become more and more warped and reality becomes less and less clear because it's, it's, you're, you're both sort of in quotes in this together. Um, and that was absolutely what happened with my mom and I. I had known that she had some odd eating habits or lack of, you know, she, she, she would always skip breakfast. She would have a chewy granola bar for lunch, eat half of it, leave it on the counter. She'd have steamed vegetables for dinner, nothing on them, just a, a plate of steamed vegetables. And I started piecing together that that was not what other, what I was seeing other people eat. 
Um, but also she was really helping me with my eating disorder, which I, at that point, couldn't identify as an eating disorder because of course I was living in the delusion of it. So there is, there is this sort of like connection formed between the two of you through it. Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. And I thought, I thought it was like the way that I saw it at the time was that we were best friends. In my mind, it was like a parent trap montage where they're like doing the hand jives, they're jumping and clicking their heel, they're doing the little like shake. Um, I thought it was a way for me and mom to be closer, to be more connected, to be best friends. And uh, only later did I realize that that wasn't what was happening. Well, I want to talk a little bit about the, the the later there. So, like, you write about some of these some of these things that would be in the Parent Trap montage. I mean, yeah. you know, again, teaching you disordered eating. You know, you mentioned the at-home makeovers where she would dye her hair and eyelashes. Yeah. You even describe in the book her showering you, like, well into your teens. Um, and it, it obviously has taken a lot of therapy and a lot of work to recover from all this. But given what you just said about, like, only later did I realize... What's it been like to have to revisit these experiences in order to write about them? Mm. I had done so much work privately in therapy for years, you know, probably six or seven years before uh, even considering exploring them in a, in a, in a memoir. Um, so I, f- I felt like I had done, uh, done a lot of that work and through that work, been able to excavate and I think acknowledge, I hope acknowledge what is worth sharing with other people and what's just for me and what is entertaining and what isn't. I think that's really important. Uh, I never said, I did not at all set out to just like do some kind of, um, like even the word memoir sounds so like dramatic. I wrote this memoir, it's so, (laughs) it feels so over the top. But um, I, I really set out to write a good book. And then the the fact that it's about my life was really secondary. And I think that I hope that objectivity that I got to through therapy um, was helpful to making um, making it as as entertaining as it could be. CBT, right? I noticed CBT in there. CBT, yeah. Big CBT like guy. CBT? Love oh. CBT. Great. What's your experience, Ben? Cognitive. Well, I'll say for people who don't know what we're talking about, cognitive behavioral therapy. Uh, I, I, I used to get a, a panic attacks guy, big panic attack guy. Okay. Love okay. panic attacks. And I would <laughs> <laughs> just got a t-shirt that says big <laughs> panic attack guy. Uh, I would, I would have, I, got- I would have to write the number like, okay. And then like, I would write the number from anxiety I was feeling from like eight to 10. So yes. when I saw that happen, can you talk about that in your book? Like when I saw that in your book, I got so excited that there was a fellow CBT person there. Yes. First off, I also have to say, I hope that you do genuinely make those shirts all buy one all line up for one um and it makes me really happy that mental health discussions are at this place where people are able to embrace them and be lighthearted about them it's just it's so wonderful i feel like the movement is it, there's so much movement around mental health and it's just it's amazing um and i've lost the question because i'm too excited about those t-shirts well let me let me ask you this are you able to find is there like a catharsis in being able to find humor in something that was traumatic when you were going through it Yes, yes. Oh my God. Yes. A million times. Yes. I think that, well, first off, I think that life is never one thing. My life absolutely has never been one thing. It's usually happy and sad at the same time and laughable and tragic at the same time, oftentimes in the same room. Um, So that's sort of my overall point of view. But then just in the writing of the book, I'm sitting there crying, you know, while writing one chapter or while writing one paragraph and then laughing the next paragraph. And I, I think that's like, that's the experience of being a person, right? It's like, it's just all the shades, all the colors, all the emotions, um, sometimes back to back to back. I I wanted to ask you something else about the disordered eating you you describe in the book, which is a unique situation that you found yourself in. So you, you know, you're, you're experiencing disordered eating, you're, you know, you're experiencing anorexia. And your character, Sam Puckett on iCarly, is food obsessed, is, you know, yes. butter, uh, fried chicken, turkey legs, pastries, yeah. all these as props. In your personal life, you're struggling with an eating disorder. Like, w- w- what is that? What is that like? At the time, it was very challenging. Uh, I didn't really know how to navigate it. Now I see it for the truly the comedy gold that it is like I 
there was no, like, what it, the, the, who could write that, right? The fact that I'm suffering from these eating disorders while also playing a character who loves food. It's, it's, um, it is, I, I think it's very entertaining. It's, oh, I'm glad. I'm glad. <laughs> I'm glad. <laughs> I guess, yeah, I guess it is sort of entertaining, but it must have been some hard in the moment, though, Jeanette. But... Oh, oh, yeah. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. And I think and also I think it's important to, you know, finding humor in things with time. I don't see it as in any way discrediting or dishonoring whatever my emotional experience was at the time. Yeah, yeah. I just see it as sort of the changing and the evolving of, of perspective um, and also the luxury of time and how much yeah. it helps perspective. And, and um, but but I, I was really. I say it with a smile now, um, but I was really struggling and it was really, really challenging. Um, and also I didn't have the tools to even understand how to go about dealing with any, I didn't know how to go, you know, people, people would, would recognize me for, for my character and would scream just excitedly. They were excited to see a person from a show that they love and they're going, Sam, where's the fried chicken? And I'm thinking like, I mean, I got that dozens of times a day like this was that was a thing that people said repeatedly and I just uh remember my whole body would kind of stiffen and I'd think like oh god because I knew what was going on underneath it but at that I was nowhere near at a place where I was able to share that experience that this this being able to look back is it was already blowing my mind before we started this interview but it's even blowing my mind now like with with being able like the change of perspective when you're able to look back at this time in your life isn't it helpful? Yeah. Do you find that? Yeah, I definitely find that, you know, like I, I and I even find it when I'm going through hard stuff now, I'll go like, hey, you know what? I bet. Give me three months. I bet I can. I bet I'll find this funny. And what I'll try to do is try to t t say it, say the moment that's happening in hindsight. Like if I'm going through a hard thing, yes. I'll, I'll say one time I was and I'll mention the hard thing. So it'll just seem like a story to me. You know, I absolutely love that. I'm going to adopt that uh, tool. We're gonna get that, and the T-shirts. You and I are gonna. We're gonna be. Great. We're gonna be millionaires. It's gonna be incredible. Tools and T-shirts. Cool. Now, Jeanette, I'll, I'll ask you something um, else here now, and I want to remind you again that we're pre-taping. So you oh. do write uh, about the sort of toxic work environment you were in, in in Nickelodeon, especially around the showrunner who was only called the creator in your book. And I'll, I'll read what you write here. You write he was mean spirited, controlling, and terrifying, and prone to make grown men and women cry with his insults and degradation. So with a bit of distance now, with a bit of distance now, what was it like working under those conditions, not as a grown adult, but as a kid? You know, this is, this is one of those kind of hot button topics that I've seen a lot in the, in the headlines, especially the early headlines about the book. And I just feel like I, I really, this is, you know, it's, it, I, I've said this before, but I, but I mean it genuinely that I've said everything that I yeah. could say about this, like in the book. Um, and I think the story is so much more significant and, and, and hopefully important and healing than any of these aspects. And so I really try not to focus on them too much because I just think yeah. it's, it, it's, it does a disservice to the ultimate themes and the connection that I think people are feeling from the book. I understand that. Yeah, I get that. You write a book about, I mean, I read the book, you write a book about the, the, the trauma you've gone through and the, and the kind of arc of your life. And then there's one story that's a very small part of the book that, that got to suck a little bit. I get that. Totally. Totally. Yeah. It was, uh, it wasn't, it, it wasn't what I set out to do. I, I just set out to truly to, to, to write a good book and write something that I hoped would connect with people. And I'm, I'm so glad to see that it's doing that and that the people who read it are taking from it exactly what I hoped they would. They are in no way confused or taking one aspect of it. It seems like they're really taking the fullness of, of the book. And uh, I'm, I'm grateful for that. Well, let, let me move on then. I want to talk about child stardom. You said in the book, child stardom is a trap. Yeah. Can you tell me more about that? I think that no child is psychologically, emotionally, mentally equipped for the obstacles of child stardom, even if they have the greatest support system around them. I just think it's such a bizarre um, environment 
again, if they have the best circumstances, I just think it's such a bizarre environment and the experience of being publicly recognized or even famous at an early age, just if you don't have the psychological tools, if your mind isn't psychologically developed to the place that you can understand what's happening and understand the difference between, um, between what is reality and what isn't, I just think it's really, really dangerous. And I'm so proud of any of my fellow child performers who have gotten to the other side of it and done that work and are able to grow and work on things that they want to be working on and set examples for everyone else. Drew Barrymore's done it. Scarlett Johansson's done it. Natalie Portman, like these, they're, they set an amazing example. Um, and of course I can't speak for them or what their experience of, of, of child stardom was, but um, my view of it is, is definitely very, very strongly in the direction of it's, it's, severely unhealthy and and um and challenging does it ever come to you why we're still okay with it like you're not the first child star to have a traumatic memoir and do you know what i mean like why we as a society are still kind of okay with it knowing what we know but no i would even say obsessed with it i i think there's a certain focus on kid stars that is beyond what what adult stars experience there's there's so many people weighing in on what they should do and shouldn't do and how they need to act and need to be and need to dress and need to look it's like i I don't understand where that obsession comes from or why um but i do think everyone needs a little cbt so they can work on this uh whatever's going on with them that makes them obsessed with child children's careers so while you're on icarly your mom's cancer reappears. And um, while you're filming the show, she dies from her cancer. And I know you had a really fraught relationship with your mom towards the end of her life. But I also know there's a lot of love, but there's also the title of the book. I'm, I'm glad my mom died. When she died, where were you emotionally? At the time, I was completely devastated and did not know truly what to do with myself. I had no sense of who I was because I had spent so long, I had spent my entire life up to that point trying to funnel myself into whatever mom wanted me to be. Then she she dies and I realize, oh, I, I don't know who I am now. I don't know who I am without her because I was living for her and now she's dead, what do I do with myself? It was, it was uh, overwhelming. And also, and I'm only able to see this now because I couldn't face this at the time, but there was some relief there. And I didn't know, I felt so guilty about that relief that I would just shove it down, shove it down. Um, and and now I see that relief as being, I think there was a part of me that knew, uh, that knew whatever the journey was to come was one that would be worth the while. And, and also just to not have her day-to-day pressures and expectations and, and you know, manipulation and all of that. Did you feel guilty about the relief or did you feel shameful about the relief? Did you feel like there was something wrong with you for feeling relief? Mm, That's an interesting distinction. Probably both. I would say both. I think I felt guilty because of the narratives that are out there of, uh, you know, there's, there's this, there's this societal narrative of having deceased people on pedestals. Yeah. You can't have you can't say one bad word about them. They're everybody who dies is suddenly the greatest person in the world and that's how you need to view them. So I had that kind of in my mind. I think I felt guilty for that reason, but the shame was probably the shame's the, the of course the deeper more uncomfortable to unpack emotion that I'm sure was there just because of the whole upbringing and, and, and being defined by her for so long. When did you realize that you needed to talk to somebody, that you needed some help? Pretty early on after she died, but, and I talk about this a lot in the book, but what really um, was interesting to me was that the first therapist that I saw, I would tell her these things about my relationship with my mom. And I was of course trying to go at it from a very protective of mom, um, viewpoint everything that i said was as disclaimery as possible and as mom's as as wedged through the lens of mom's great as possible and she would look at me and she goes what you're talking about is abuse do you understand that what you're talking about is abuse 
I couldn't handle that information at the time. I was still determined to keep my mom on that pedestal. So I quit that, that first therapist. And then uh, eventually it was, I want to say at least a year before I was able to revisit therapy. And that was specifically for eating disorders, which um, I think was really important to, to, I think it was important that the first aspect uh, of recovery was for eating disorders, because I don't think I could have unpacked any of the specifics of my life or explored any of the complicated emotional layers that were there had I not at first gotten that eating, had I not first gotten the eating disorder under control. Uh, and I hope if anybody out there listening is struggling with eating disorders, I, I hope that's helpful in some way, because for me, there's like, there, there was too much going on. I needed to get that. I needed to get a, a handle on that first. One of the things you did to take care of yourself is, was to quit acting. How did you, how did you get there? Took a while. Yeah. Uh, there was a lot of back and forth, a lot of doubt, self-doubt around that decision. Um, and ultimately I said, you know what? I was working on a show. I was working on a Netflix show at the time. And I said, I'm going to see this show through to whenever it's done. And then once it's done, I'm just going to take a break. And that was my way of kind of just saying, I'll follow through on the commitment and then, and then just let life kind of lead me. The show got canceled and I said, okay, now, now is the time when I'm going to quit. I called my agents and managers at the time. It was a very quick conversation. We're talking less than three minutes. Um, so then I hang up and I'm like, wait, was that easier than it should have been? Shouldn't it have been a little harder. <laughs> um, but it was a good learning lesson. And, uh, and then of course there were, there were, you know, s six months or so where after that decision, I completely thought, Oh God, what did I do? I walked away from a career that so many people want and, and, and why would I walk away at this time? And what was I thinking? And, um, and it was challenging to stick to my guns, but I did because as much self doubt as there was underneath it, there was that feeling of, I, I know it's the right decision. And I think that's, that's such a hard thing of life, right? Where it's, you, you know, that you're doing the right thing, but just because you know that you're doing the right thing doesn't mean there's not self-doubt surrounding it. It's not like you say, oh, I'm doing the right thing. And then you just never look back and you leap into the sky and run for whatever you're, you're now running to. I feel like <laughs> for me, at least there's, there's still self-doubt and still anxiety around, did I do the right thing? Should I have what, what, and the questions and the unanswered questions and the uncertainty. Um, but I, I stuck to my guns and I, and I threw myself into, into writing. And if, I mean, look how it paid off for you. I mean, look, look how many people you're touching with this book and how many people whose lives are, are being changed because of your book. But what about you? Like, oh, how are you changed by writing this book? A big thing for me is how much simpler my grief toward my mom has become because it used to be so complicated and I'd feel so angry that I, I'd, I'd, I'd feel like I miss her. I'd start crying. I'd feel angry that I was crying. I'd feel mom doesn't deserve my tears. She abused me. How, how is there still room to miss this person as in my bones as I do when she treated me the way that she did? She doesn't deserve me to feel this way. It was so complicated and it'd go from the pendulum swing. It'd be sadness, then anger, then guilt at feeling the anger, then back to sadness. It was just confused. And since writing the book, I think that so much healing happened that now I'm able to truly just go, oh, wow, I miss mom. And it can even be, you know, just the simplest of, of grief. And I, uh, I'm relieved that grief can be simple in that way. That's a beautiful book. I'm, I was quite touched by it. And um, it was lovely to get a chance to talk to you about it today. Thank you. I, I so appreciate your approach to what you do. You too. Thanks. <laughs> 